Today, we're going to shred plastic, make sparks, get high-tech, zoom in way more than necessary, get even more high-tech, get zapped by some electrical energy thing, and get hit with two stealth attack bonuses as we do a gentle restoration on the rare, unusual, and kind of impractical Miller's Fall 207 bench drill. We've got a lot of ground to cover, so let's jump right into it. I called this a gentle restoration because I wanted to try something different and keep as much of the original intact as I could. For example, the large metal pin that holds the wooden handle in place, the clamp on the base, and touching up the paint chips instead of stripping it all down and repainting it. This got me thinking, is it then a conservation instead of a restoration? In looking for the answer, I was presented with two more terms, preservation and renovation. Preservation would be if I left it as is and locked it away for safekeeping so no further damage could be done. We aren't doing that. Renovation would be if we made it look like new but changed something on it like the handle design or the color and... Uh-oh. Okay, in my defense I didn't know at the time. Besides, no one's searching for hand tool renovation. Anyway, we aren't doing that one either. That leaves conservation and restoration. The former keeps the maximum amount of material intact, while the latter is doing whatever is necessary to bring it back to its original condition and appearance. So which does this fall under? I don't know until I get deeper into it, so let's see where this takes us. We're going to pause here for a moment because I think this section is pretty interesting and deserves a bit of attention. If you look at a normal egg beater drill, it's pretty straightforward. You have the shaft, the pin, and the gear. The pin attaches the gear to the shaft which locks them together. When the gear turns, the shaft turns. Since they're locked together, the shaft can't move up and down independent of the gear. This is controlled by moving the entire drill up and down or back and forth. Here you can see the pin going through the gear and the shaft. Let's go down the rabbit hole and see what makes this drill so different. We'll go ahead and focus on the turn screw, shaft, gear, and the sections of the base they're attached to. Like the egg beater drill, when the gear turns, the shaft turns. Unlike the egg beater drill, the shaft can move up and down independent of the gear. The turn screw moves the shaft up and down and is restricted by threads cut into the base. If we zoom in on the gear and shaft assembly, we see the turn screw is attached to the shaft by a pin. It locks the two sections together while allowing the shaft to spin freely. With the egg beater drill, the gear was attached to the shaft with a pin. There is no pin in this gear. If we look inside, we can see a channel cut into the shaft called a keyway. 
There's also a notch cut into the gear which is also called a keyway. A small piece of steel called a key holds them together. If we remove the key, the gear spins without moving the shaft. With the key in place, the gear and shaft rotate together and because of the keyway, the shaft can move up and down independent of the gear. If you're enjoying this video, feel free to mash that like button. I'll cover a bit of my background and why this video looks the way it does at the end of this build. I cut loose with a little eye candy and, as a bonus, I've tacked on a short project at the end of this video. Be sure to stick around for that. Now that we've covered how this is constructed, it'll make more sense when we take apart these final pieces. Let's give this a quick bath so it'll be easier to see. A quick note about the stealth bonuses. I do a lot of builds that don't need much explaining. I don't want to spam the viewers with short videos or artificially lengthen them into longer videos and waste people's time, so I tried to incorporate them into a bigger project and make them part of the story. Let me know in the comments if you like them or if they're more of a distraction. All this standing is making my leg hurt. My neighbor was throwing away the stool because one of the feet had broken off it. I know you can buy generic replacements, but I prefer the originals. Unfortunately, they no longer make them, so let's make our own real quick. Besides, I've been looking for an excuse to do something with Delrin. Pretty close. I intentionally made it a little beefier than originally planned. Perfect. This cookie tin makes a great shield. On to sanding. And sanding. And sanding. And sanding. Looks pretty good. More than 90% of the paint is in excellent shape, so I'm just going to clean off the paint spatter and dirt. Not sure what this is, but it has to come out. And here I get a little help from my shop assistant. Pull it out. I'm soaking these parts in acetone to get rid of the old grease. I want to give a demonstration of a technique I use. This is an adjustment knob from a hand plane. I saturate a piece of cotton kite string in Brasso and use it to get into these tight areas. You can see the string starts to turn black as it removes the tarnishing. I'll let the Brasso sit, then buff it out with a clean piece of string. It turned out really good and only takes a few minutes to do. I use the same technique to clean lantern pinions from old clock gears. Why am I telling you this? So the snooks part will make some sense, except that in this case I'm dipping the string in acetone. It works really well. I'm really hoping that a lot more of this logo is intact, but I won't know for sure until I clean it off. 
The gentlest way I know of doing this is with 3-in-1 oil. I had worked on an old sewing machine a while back, and the chemicals I was using started to wear away some of the decals. I switched to using oil, which removed the dirt while keeping the decals intact. I'm speeding up the video here, so it probably looks like I'm being a bit more aggressive than I actually am. I'm using moderate pressure over the paint, but barely any pressure over the decals. I can't tell you how happy I was to see that most of the decal was there and looked better than I thought it would. Here I'm removing the rust from the chips in the paint. I'm using a very light touch and just kissing the surface. I did the same thing on the body of the drill. I'm using mineral spirits here to clean off any oil and dust from the metal in preparation for painting. This is a quick demonstration to show you don't need expensive equipment to clean these things up. When you have a five-year-old, you end up with an endless supply of Play-Doh containers that are great for storing small parts. Remembering which container holds what is a whole other issue. Here's where I really started to overthink things. I wanted to get a really good look at it, so I put it under my digital microscope and it looked like rust or flaking off metallic shavings, I don't know. Brass doesn't rust, so I thought it might be some kind of other metal. I was trying to figure out how I was going to deal with this thing, which included possibly brass plating it. I decided to use brass on the back of it as a test. Fortunately, what I thought might be rust turned out to be really bad tarnishing. My concerns that this was some other metal vanished. After doing a few test areas on the front to make sure, I gave it a gentle rub with Brasso, then took it to my leather strop which cleaned it off in no time. The part I was the most concerned with turned out to be the easiest. I'll do a final polish when I put the drill back together. This handle was far too gone and needed to be stripped down and repainted. I've had a Harbor Freight sandblasting cabinet for over a year that I hadn't put together. There's a bit more to the story as to why it sat for a year, but I don't want to take up your time with that. Needless to say, I went ahead and put it together, did some recommended mods from other YouTubers, and gave it a spin. There was one mod that I hadn't done yet, which is probably the most important. It deals with improving how the sand is fed through. After using it, that mod is pretty critical. I would get one or two centimeters cleaned off and the sand would stop flowing. I would have to reseat the feeder tube or bang the handle. It was frustrating, but when it worked, it was amazing. I kept going off camera to save space recording. In the end, I got through it, then primed and painted this handle. The indentions you see here are from the screw that holds the table in place, not pitting as a result of rust. Here I'm using grease to hold the key into the gear's keyway. This will also make it easier to assemble. Okay, that sounds a bit dry. I'll be adding oil via access holes in the base once it's put together.
I'd cleaned off the dirt on the wood handle, gave it a light sanding, then varnished it. This pin has too much of a bend in it, and I'm going to have to straighten it out a bit. <laughs> ah, this is more my speed. Evidently, I'm not ready for the big one yet. On Scoutcrafter's channel, he's big on using an angle grinder. So much so that I went out and bought one and promptly mauled a scrap tool with it. I was not a fan. It takes a bit of practice to develop that gentle touch and this project seemed like a good way to give it another go since this rail is pretty forgiving. I ended up falling in love with it and it was a great way to practice using this tool. Off camera I used an orbital sander to smooth it all out. Please tell me I'm not the only one with this issue. I'm predicting a shop organization video in my future. And here we are. I'm pretty happy with it. This thing is smooth as silk. Normal bits are too long and the only small ones I have are from my push drills. I called this tool impractical during the intro. It's a bit awkward and I feel like I need three hands to use it. You can use a clamp to hold things down, but with such a small base it doesn't seem useful for anything sizable. The biggest issue I had was with the body. I tried several paints but couldn't match the darkness of the Japani. In the end, I used this paint for engine blocks. I did several layers on the chips, then a thin wash over the entire body to make it seamless. So back to the original question. What did I do? I feel like I might have bounced a bit between a restoration and conservation depending on the part. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. All I know is that the next time my wife looks at the tools I haven't gotten to yet and calls me a tool hoarder, I'm responding with, no, I'm a tool preservationist. My original goal in life was to be an artist. I'm also into gaming, board games, computer games, RPGs. As life progressed, I got into programming, game development, 3D graphics, and 3D modeling. Currently, I work full-time as a programmer. So if I could sum up this channel, I would say it's what do you get when you take an artist, gamer, programmer, 3D modeler, game developer and put them into a workshop making videos. Hopefully it won't be a complete disaster. With my first video, I wanted to learn video editing and how to set up a YouTube channel. It got two views and flatlined. My second one was me doing more with video editing and trying to throw in some humor. It did 10 times better with 20 views before flatlining. The next one was my attempt at doing a full-blown video and voiceovers. It did 300 times better and right now is over 6,000 views and is still going. I know there are channels that get 10 times that many in an hour and mine has taken months, but for being brand new to this, I found it exciting and encouraging. I was so happy the first time I got 100 views in a day. I told my wife and she said, good job, now can you clean the litter box? Which brings us to this video. Here I'm unloading my bag of tricks I've picked up over the years. I have much to learn and there's lots of room for improvement, but hopefully I'm headed in the right direction. 
I'm having a lot of fun on this journey, and you can follow along by subscribing. Now, as promised, here's a bonus build I think you'll enjoy. I need to put my logo on this rough wood for a thumbnail. I could poke holes around the letters with a pin, but there's a better way. A sewing machine makes quick work of it. Next we'll need a pounce pad, plastic bag, baby powder, cotton balls, old sock. Put the cotton balls in the bag, mix in the baby powder, and put the cotton in the sock. In between each layer of cotton balls, add more powder. Three layers should do. Tie off the sock and you're done. Lay down your pattern, pound and rub the pad over it, and voila. My board is rough, but the impression is enough for my needs. Here's how it works on a smooth surface. And finally, the completed sign in the thumbnail. I really hope you enjoyed this video. Feel free to check out my other videos. Thanks for stopping by, and I'll see you next time.